So good uh, afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining this uh, webinar session, uh, the subject being wealth management and putting the AI into data. <clears throat> We've got about uh, just under an hour where we'll be going through some of the themes and topics uh, around AI and data and how it can help wealth management. Um, we're just going to go through a couple of details around housekeeping and then a profile on myself and, and Will, and then we'll, get to, we'll dive straight into the, uh, into the subject area. Um, so I, I have been asked just to uh, go through a couple of these details first, and then we'll get into the um, profile of us, and then we'll start. But firstly, just from a housekeeping perspective, I've been asked to ensure that to let you all know that the webcast will be recorded. Um, and the webcast slides, resources, and recording will be emailed to all uh, people who've registered um, to this webinar. Um, please use the widgets at the bottom to discover the platform features if you're curious. Um, do submit any questions you have via Q&A. Um, I'll be moderating, so as and when these questions come in, I will look to address as many of these as I can um, as we go through the session. Um, and then for any help and technical requirements, please just click on the yellow um, question icon below. Um, and from a technical tips perspective, um, you know, the, click on the, uh, on, the, on the media player on your screen to enable sound, etc. cetera. Um, there is no dial-in number. It's just a webcast audio which will be streamed through to your computer. Um, and if the slides are not moving, please just refresh your browser. So that's the uh, housekeeping and technical tips. Um, so let's just go to the introduction. So, Will, why don't you introduce yourself first, and then I'll go second. Certainly, Christopher. I head the wealth management practice for Sellant. Sellant is the research arm of Oliver Wyman, the global consulting firm. Um, the focus of our research and advisory services at Sellant is the intersection between strategy and technology for the financial services ecosystem, and I'm very excited to be here. Excellent. Thank you, Will. Um, so my name is Christopher Spark. I look after our digital solutions and front office solutions for wealth management at Refinitiv. Um, as a very uh, brief bit of background, I mean, I've been with Refinitiv for uh, 13 years. Prior to that, I actually worked for a UK self-directed wealth management institution. Um, so delighted really to be on, on this call now and to really provide, hopefully, some moderation and some insight into how we think of data and how that can help um, wealth institutions. Um, so moving forwards, uh, in terms of what we'll discuss, <clears throat> we want to try and keep it uh, as fairly uh, agile as we can. So as and when questions come in, we'll look to address those. But we're going to try and get into four main areas. So really, the, the first being discussing data as a source of intelligence to financial advisors and the investor behavior, and ultimately going into the use cases around that and how that can be leveraged to, I guess, help and advance a wealth institutions' needs to connect, engage, uh, and serve their customers digitally and, and more intelligently as, as, we, as, as the time progresses. And in terms of the second area is the opportunities and uh, limitations of several current AI technologies. This is really just getting into some of the challenges around data, big data, and AI, and, and potentially some of the ways that those can be going to overcome. The third area will be changes in data management by wealth management firms overall, and that can be as much of a cultural change as well as a technology change around embracing technology and data management. And then the last area will be kind of some of the things we think about with respect to advisors and how they can jumpstart their capabilities with, with wealth advisory solutions. So those are the four main areas that we'll be discussing. Um, the first thing we're going to do before we actually go into sort of the, the Q&A around some of the discussion points is just to ask you a question. So if you can see on your screen, um, there is, the first question is, what are the biggest obstacles to harnessing the power of data? Um, and then you can see that there should be uh, four multiple choice options. Once you've selected your preferred answer, if you then select submit, um, we should then be able to uh, progress to the first question, and we can then look at the answers post that. So please now have a look at the question and submit what you think the best answer is. So progressing forwards, um, Will, maybe I'll I'll start with a question for you. 
so as we think about um, you know these discussion points, you know AI and big data they aren't necessarily terms that are brand new. So you know why AI and why now for wealth management? What, what's that? Give us give us the high level view around why it's so important in today's market to be thinking of AI and big data. Well, certainly, Christopher, and 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 you're right. Um, I mean, the, these terms have not uh, uh, are not new to us, and in fact, uh, I think big data was extremely hot as a term about about eight or nine years ago. And and I think what's changed in that is it's now possible to realize much of the potential of big data and and by extension AI that it simply wasn't before. And you know, it's often said that we've had three uh, kind of life cycles or, or waves of AI, um, each culminating um, in, in sort of disappointment um, or, or disillusionment. But now a lot has changed. And I, I'd underscore sort of the enhancement of, of processing speed um, from an IT standpoint. And I, just an absolute explosion in the volume of data and the accessibility of data out there and the the entrance of of low cost computing and specifically the cloud as a means of of managing capacity flexibility in data management and and ultimately low cost storage as well for me those are some of the big game changers we've seen and then also just if you maybe some insight around um when we think about you know between smart data and ai i mean can you help just differentiate a little bit what you mean and what we what we are referring to between when we say AI versus smart data? Well, certainly, and I think it's important to to, to start by defining what smart data actually means. The challenge is, is is it means different things to different people and different organizations. I mean, for some organizations, the smart use of data or the effective use of data is really delivering on the promise of of straight through processing. Right. For others, uh, you know, you look in the family office space or, or even large global financial institutions, it means migrating from paper communications to electronic communications and eliminating much of the, the redundant processes in the back office. In others, and to the question you just asked, I, I'd say it's, it's about transforming the culture. So I think a bottom line, though, firms need to get their data house in order. And, and we're talking some, some, some pretty foundational work here, Christopher, eliminating data silos between different parts of the organizations, being able to achieve a 360-degree view of the client, for example. Until you do that, you're not going to be able to, to derive intelligent insights from your data. You're not going to be able to realize the power of machine learning the ability to, 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 to rationalize your use of data and get real actionable um, opportunities from it. So it's really cleaning up. It's really leveraging your data and using it in a smart way. And that's the road to harnessing the capabilities of artificial intelligence today. Right. So it's almost like enterprise data management facilitates then the analytic and AI capabilities. But without that foundation, essentially, you're going to struggle to deploy machine learning and AI to help with those insights, right? Absolutely, Christopher. And, and, and you can pinpoint specific issues depending on the organization. I mean, it may, be talk, it may be data architecture. The architecture is outmoded or redundant. And, you know, firms have have grown over the years by acquiring uh, competitors and, and peers in the industry. And each time that happens, there's an extra layer of architecture. Likewise, storage is a big issue that firms need to find a solution. And there's increasing comfort with, with the cloud and, and, and uh, balancing that with security is important as well. So we're really in the midst of it. We're at an inflection point in, in terms of new approaches to data management. And I think that's key. Got it. Let's have a quick look at the poll results. So we've, uh, we've just seen that um, the question was, what are the biggest obstacles to harnessing the power of data? Um, I mean, almost dare I say it, the answers uh, may not be so surprising, right? I mean, you know, the, the challenge obviously is all of the institutions that we work for are based on the legacy of technology and, and culture. And so therefore, you know, you have nearly 67% saying the, you know, the obstacle of harnessing power is legacy systems. You know, I guess no surprise. 
Um, again, you know, organizational culture as well. I guess you know this can be thought of certainly you know within my perspective of Refinitiv and Thomson Reuters historically and, and how we think about you know embracing technology change. You know, compliance and cloud. There's definitely a, a organizational cultural shift that needs to happen as well. I mean, anything, Will, you want to add there? I have to say, I'm not so surprised. But you know, any thoughts? No, I would just underscore, Christopher, that you know, le- the issue of legacy systems and culture change are not mutually exclusive. In fact, you know, many organizations are going to be tackling these both at once. I would add that you know, if you'd asked this question five years back, I think you'd get double digits for sure. Um, on the third option around compliance, but but I mean, while that is certainly not diminishing in absolute terms, you know, the extreme focus on compliance-related issues from a data standpoint, I think, has has somewhat run its course. Great. All right. So look, let's move on. Um, I think you know when we think about AI and data, you know, I think w- one of the things we should really try and drill into is um, some of the opportunity areas and some of the use cases for wealth management institutions. So why, why don't you start, Will, and you know, give us a, some of your views around how a wealth institution today can leverage technology and AI to generate use cases that align with business goals that wealth firms have around you know, client engagement, net new business, et cetera. Thank you, Christopher, and I appreciate the opportunity to discuss these themes because really these are critical, right? I mean, where does the rubber hit the road? Where are you getting traction or at least opportunity in terms of the use of of your data and, and, and in terms of the use of artificial intelligence to derive insights and actionable opportunities from that data? Investment, uh, decision-making, or ideation is, is nothing new, right? You've had sort of Bridgewater-style hedge funds using data for investment insights from, from early days. And, you know, it's been uh, widely publicized, for example, the um, firms like Goldman Sachs and BlackRock um, replacing human portfolio managers with um, algorithms to, to come up with investment uh decisions is stock picking essentially. So you have now, of course, the emergence of sentiment analysis, you know, being able to identify patterns in social media and, and elsewhere as, as tools for, for getting a leg up, if you will. And we'll talk more about alternative data later in this broadcast. Risk and compliance is another big one. And, and, and really, in many ways, this is a number crunching exercise, um, at least in early stages, to identify anomalies, uh, suspicious behaviors, unusual patterns, and and it's no secret to 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 anyone on this call the the degree of rigor that needs to be imposed to identify bad actors who will really try to do anything and everything to 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 sort of present themselves as legitimate. So I, I think from a KYC AML standpoint, you know, there, there's already established use cases, but here's where the the proverbial puck is heading, and to me, it's about you know reinventing or scaling the role of the advisor, increasing productivity and efficiency through the use of AI. For example, you know, the annual client review might take six or seven hours to prepare, right? What if by pressing a button, you're able to pull all the information, all the interactions you've had with the client and others as well may have had throughout the firm and summarize them in a neat report that can be acted upon at once? Or how about if you're able to learn up quickly on a topic where you haven't really been working intensively, say alternatives or, or, or derive insight from experiences with other customers or clients you've worked with in the past. So this kind of productivity increase is a huge area of opportunity for AI. But I, I, I guess I'd pause here and, and ask you, Christopher, I mean, Refinitiv is, is, is you know, a, a data shop and, and many things more, but certainly you're working on these issues all the time. Where do you see the fundamental opportunities or the biggest opportunities in this field? Yeah, well, thank you. Um, I think the starting point is, as you say, you know, traditional means of stock selection and asset allocation um, really are focused or were focusing on data to help with ultimate total return and investment insight. I think what we what we see here is <clears throat> the need to help uh, advisors gain improved traction and engagement with their clients. 
And so it's less about the investment management and it's more about the relationship angle. You know, we, we see that, for example, a number of institutions are, are challenged today with the fact that their advisors may be using between seven to nine different applications. And often those are not necessarily connected, they don't talk, the data attributes don't pass. So one of the things we, we're looking at actually is how do we build you know, views that engage a practice management view for the advisor? And that's really around the integration of um, various different applications and the data source uh, connecting those applications. And then you know, once you do that, you know, areas that we're looking from a use case perspective to help with, certainly from a, um, a kind of global perspective, our, our view is to try and enable a almost a compliance rigor around product distribution and the associated content. So that from a suitability perspective, the right product is being delivered and presented to the advisors, the, the best product for their client. And then there's also kind of added to the compliance side is just the intelligent product mapping. So harnessing your data that you have on your client with your product so that you can start to better think about the products that are more relevant for certain client types based on their, based on their risk profile, et cetera. And then one of the other areas is really helping, you know, a use case is helping the advisor take action. So when you start mapping data from CRM systems or, you know, other tools like LinkedIn into then your client data that you have today from your back office with then, you know, all of the referential content, it's utilizing those things to help the advisor decide and think about when they take action to be informed so that if there is a meeting update or if there is a uh, profile update on one of their clients from a th another source, you know, that is surfaced to the advisor in a way that means they, think they can intelligently take action on that, whether it's adjusting a financial plan, whether it's you know, looking at specific products, et cetera, whether it's about having the right agenda for the next meeting. So it's utilizing data all to help ultimately the advisor be more intelligent when they think about the way that they plan their client engagement. And again, we should highlight that that's on a backdrop of you know, an increasing demand for advisors to manage more accounts more effectively. So just, just some thoughts there as well. No, I, I think that's right, Christopher. And, and ultimately, at the end of the day, I see every wealth manager trying to attack the same problem, which is there are only so many high net worth clients out there, and how are you going to serve them effectively? And so ultimately, the name of the game is rationalizing your delivery model, right? Increasing advisor productivity so that the advisor can serve more clients and uh, more effectively. And technology is really the lever. In fact, the experience uh, should not be less personalized, but should use technology to make it a an intimate, a highly interactive interaction between uh, client and, and advisor. Yeah, exactly. All right. So I guess moving on, you know, more insight from analytics. So, you know, I guess, you know, what I'd be interested in where the starting point is, you know, the slide here is showing kind of the business value and then there's the, the, the data lake and the data warehouse. So, you know, almost let's start with data lake versus data mart. So which is better, Will? Can you give us give us some views on what other <laughs> options exist? Right, right. No, absolutely, Christopher. And and, and of course, like like all um, sort of questions that touch on technology evolution. It's often not about sort of one better but or, or worse, but one, one that might be more suitable for the organization depending on where it is in terms of its data maturity. Uh, I, I'd say that sort of traditional uh, data marts, what we you know describe as the relational database management system. Um, you know, we're, we're going to dive in in a slide or two on, 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 on their limitations, but the, the upshot is that they model data as a set of tables and columns, much like an Excel spreadsheet, and they join data when the data sets that they're using start to become interrelated. And, and, and achieving these joins or connecting data in this way is, is technically complex. It's rather expensive to operate, and it's not that fast. In other words, doing these calculations or connecting data in real time while the end user is there waiting is a laborious process. And as the data, the volume of data starts to increase, uh, performance tends to falter. 
what what the, the the data lake tries to do is is to sort of eliminate the extract transform load process whereby you 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 are are, are kind of sanitizing your data making uh, all the data very structured and ordered as 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 you would have in in, in sort of a, an excel type table um whereby the the data lake as you will is able to digest data in its in its raw or native form, um, th this is this is powerful, and this is this allows tremendous flexibility in a way in a in a day and age where unstructured data is the rule. So, by unstructured data, we're talking about social media data. We're talking basically about any data that cannot be put in a in a table and and column form. The problem is that these data lakes need ongoing maintenance. Um, they need to have a steady hand at the wheel to make sure that the information going in is relevant, that um, the, the, the information can be processed, is being processed correctly, that information that may be coming in at, from all sides of the organization, uh, for example, via mobile devices, um, is, is, is clean, or at least reasonably clean and can be used. So, a lot of times that maintenance is really not part of the plan or it doesn't happen as well as it should, and the data lake becomes a data swamp. So I think that, you know, one of the things you surfaced as well, though, is, you know, when you talk about the, the, the different um, attributes of data, I guess at the same time, what you're also highlighting is when we start going into unstructured data, there's so much more data that can provide value if harnessed in the right way. You know, I guess you know, you're almost thinking about this is, you know, as you look at some of the dilemmas of data management and the ways that you look to harness the value, do you have any views or tips for a, an easier way to try and fix some of the challenges in terms of managing data? Are there any basic rules? I know we said enterprise data management at the beginning and almost fixing the foundation, but are there, are there, is there any guidance will around as we look at these different options especially with unstructured data how one can look to to better leverage them with with you know overcoming some of the challenges yes christopher i think you've touched on a key issue and and again this will tie back to objectives i mean are are you trying to trying to improve your analytics um, in, in order to provide insights, say, to the advisor, or are you trying to develop a next best action or next best offer proposition whereby you, you're actually prompting um, uh, the advisor, harnessing data to give the advisor actionable recommendations, or, for example, pulling data from different systems. Say you might have your chat, um, you know, chat, for example, or instant messaging is widely used for communication in some markets, for example, Asia, much less so in North America. You know, are, are you trying to pull data from that channel and tie it to, say, what you have in your CRM system? So I, I think it's important uh, to, to sort of uh, go slowly, step by step. Tie the data you have on your customers, your 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 transaction data, um, the data you have on your markets and your 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 kind of uh, client segments and reference data, for example, or master data, and and use it carefully and not try and boil the ocean. And at, to that point, it's really important to find a good partner that's helping you manage this process, both from a systems integration standpoint and in terms of actual data management. And you know, I'm, I'm sure you have a perspective on this. I mean, you're helping firms, you know secure the right data, access the right data, but also manage it more effectively. And, and, and I think you'd agree that, you know, this is something that best done in steps, not all at once. Yeah, agreed. Definitely. Um, conscious that there's a lot to go through. I'm going to, I'm going to move us on. Um, so, you know, if there is a, a, a theme that says, you know, big data management is critical to enable AI, then you know that's a fairly broad statement. I guess should there be specific data types that you would recommend if you had to start this process, customers should be focusing on. And we should, you know, the question I guess is, you know, through the lens of improving client engagement. So if we want to improve client engagement, where should I be focusing my time on data? You know, 
because you know, data management itself is pretty broad. What, what, what would you say to that? Right. Well, it, you know, our first poll question actually touched on this in a way. I mean, legacy systems, right? That's a roadblock. But what does that mean? That means in practice that firms aren't getting their internal data um, in, a, in, a, in a clean and consumable fashion, right? And that just underscores my point about caution. Before you try to get every type of data out there, make sure that the data you have in-house is both clean and it's also connected. You know, I hear so many stories about a firm uh, that clients say go and get a mortgage, for example, right? And then they have to, um, you know, the, the bank or the financial institution doesn't have their investment data on hand or the client wants to look at their whole portfolio. They don't have that. So starting with internal data is important. Increasingly, however, uh, data from customer interactions is key, particularly um, interactions that may not have anything to do with the institution um, is key, particularly as we try to understand customer motivations. So there we're talking about content from, from different websites, incorporating uh, news, um, education for customers. We're also using Twitter and Facebook, um, you know, with the customer's consent to understand sort of what customers or what clients are looking for, what appeals to them, what engages them. And you're going to have increasingly data from search shopping um, being accessed and, and being uh, used as a way to understand customer motivations. I think the longer term source of data that we're going to want to leverage that's really powerful relates to the Internet of Things. So you have, for example, insurers providing discounts to customers based on, on, on log data from, from the driver. Wow, isn't that amazing? You can offer my teenage son or daughter a discount on his insurance by noticing that they're adhering to the speed limit. So that raises all sorts of questions, including around privacy. But really, the, the, the opportunities are, are vast for harnessing the, the, the data that's out there today. Okay, very good. I think, you know, I, one of the things that um, we see as well is, you know, when you think about managing the data, um, in many ways, actually, you know, we see customers through managing all of the different data they use to focus on, you know, investment decisions, Some, in, in many ways, having quite mature systems in place to, to look at, you know, pricing, news, commentary, etc. <clears throat> but actually... If you know, in answer to this question, one of the areas that I think um, you know clients could do uh, to focus on more is you know the data management they have on their own customers today and how that's organised and how that's structured. How can you leverage the data that you have on your clients to connect that to products that should be positioned, to connect that, as you say, to um, you know products that also have rules that impact them, such as you know you just said insurance and um, premiums based on. Um, you know, driving, et cetera. So yeah, if there's one area where we would also recommend is we, we see that the management of the data that you hold on your customer being of critical importance and the ability for that to be in a flexible, in many cases, cloud-based architecture so that, you know, you can start to really focus on the data that ultimately will help improve your client engagement. Completely agree with that, Christopher. And, and I think, you know, the issue we haven't really touched on relates to sort of the, the creepy factor, right? I mean, how, how, how much does your customer um, appreciate your use of the data? And, and I think we, we, we've come sort of to, an, to a time in a space where, you know, firms are, are increasingly are, understand they need to be transparent about that data use and have customer consent and all that. And as long as the purpose is benign to actually help and inform the customer's activities, then, it's a, then it can be a real win-win. Exactly. Agreed. All right, let's take another question. So um, question two, in an ideal world, what types of insight would you like to receive from improved data? So we've spoken a lot about the data, but you know, if I'm putting myself in the shoes of the participants today, um, you know, what, are the, what are the insights that potentially wealth clients would like to get better views on to help with client engagement? So um, you know, whilst people answer that question as well, I can just see that uh, I've had a question forwarded to me um, from uh, one of the participants. Um, and the question was here also around historical data. 
Um, I think what I'll do actually is I'll just let um, the participants maybe answer uh, this question first, and maybe we can uh, move to um, you know, talking about some of the uh, case study slides uh, details, and then when we can, can come back to the answers on those two. So uh, if I do move forwards, and then we'll come back to the, the answers in a second. So looking at a case study, um, Will, why don't you briefly go give us an update here? You know, we're looking at a case study really around expanding how um, you know, AI can be used to power portfolio risk assessments. Um, you know, could you elaborate a little bit about what, what you mean here? Sure. Uh, you know, risk is, is, a, is a complex and multifaceted um, animal, you know, as, as you know. And so, sort of drawing insights on, on, on pure, from pure data, from data on market performance and data from um, uh, specific, you know, Data, data catalogs or databases is one thing, but but when you talk about more abstract ideas like like the impact of tariffs or 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 the impact of a presidential election on the markets, you you, you come into in face to face with a a an assessment involving so many factors and so many flavors and so many colors of insights that really you're talking about. Uh, calculations and 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 the marrying of insights on a massive scale. And here you have the power of the computer, the AI, really come to bear on the problem. And so this is one example. You also have seen vendors like uh, Kensho, which basically are um, encyclopedic brains, if you will, that pull together um, interactions or facts that are seemingly unrelated, but in fact will be closely tied together. For example, the impact of a hurricane um, on, on, on cement stocks, right? And, and, and can you come up with an estimate for that? So that has usually powerful implications for hedge funds, but also for relationship management. And in this case, um, you know, data is pulled together in a very connective, connected way via the knowledge graph, which is something I'd certainly like to hear your take on since uh, Refinitiv has done so much work in the area. Sure. Um, well, look, I think in a very brief summary, what, what we look to leverage the knowledge graph really for in wealth or wealth use cases is really surface information, connectivities, relationships that wouldn't have otherwise been surfaced. And, and that can be relationships between, you know, securities that a client holds and, you know, suppliers or subsidiaries that are connected to those securities that they wouldn't have otherwise seen. Or it could be, you know, connecting people and, uh, you know, client types to, um, you know, surfacing, you know, new prospecting opportunities. But ultimately, you know, the business implications of the knowledge graph that we have really are to try and find insight in data that would not otherwise be connected. So that could be in a whole stream of research reports or news reports all aggregated together so that you can look at the relationships of a company to the industry, to a person, to a deal, and all of that information be surfaced in one area to help A, you know, to say from a prospecting perspective of new clients, but B, also to help with, as you were just saying, some of the risk around a portfolio um, you know, or, or, a, or a security. You know, to be able to do things like if there's been a profits warning on a security that a client doesn't hold, but it's you know closely correlated to five other securities that the client does hold, what is the correlation? How much of a risk is that? Is that something I want to look at now as a, as a an advisor, etc.? Uh, and the background to the technology is essentially that we utilize um, an open ID structure called a perm ID, which means we map all industry identification models to the perm ID. So regardless of the data set or data source, there will always be an open identifier that can work. And then that perm ID is not just on an asset, it's on anything, so a person, a building, a company, etc. We then also deploy what we call intelligent tagging, which is essentially the tagging that brings together all of the information uh, in an unstructured document or unstructured set of documents so that the output of that uh, data can be then structured in a way that enables analysis. 
And then really then it's the knowledge graph which then allows the relationships of that unstructured data which has now become structured to surface those relationships. And all of that is around surfacing information that wouldn't have otherwise identified, understanding relationships with my clients, understanding relationships with my clients and other c customers, etc. So all of that is really around driving the insight, both of um, information as it pertains to the clients and their investments, but also you know, information on you know, uh, the, the broader practice of clients that a, that a wealth firm may have and relationships that may surface better, both the existing relationship management, but also their prospecting as well. Um, yes, that's so look, right. And for me, I mean, for me that, sorry, sorry, Christopher, just was going to say no, no, you your go point to, is spot on. I mean, flexibility and speed, I, I think that's, you know, the, the, a, huge, a huge advantage of this technology. So let's go to the answer. So we, we looked at, in an ideal world, what types of insight would you like to receive and prove data from? We've got the answers here. Um, interesting that, you know, maybe not surprising, but, you know, you can see that, you know, really when we're talking about insight, I guess the answer, 73% of our participants are saying that they'd like to receive insight on product, customers, and the market. I guess what I will add to this is, um, in many ways, from a refinitive angle anyway, we think that the value when we think about insight is on the combination and not on the individual components. So to make this point, you know, to get insight on your customer is important, but to get insight on the customer, the products that they're in, and then the information that can actually impact the valuation of those products, it's that combination of things which is the insight that you know, we're looking to surface. So this answer certainly resonates with me. Will, is there anything you want to add to that? I think that's, that's I mean, as, as firms have evolved from a, from a sort of product-centric worldview or product push approach to one centered on on, on the relationship and the customer, I think you need all this information and you need to combine it in a way that's, you know, encourages or helps the advisor to arrive at a decision or course of action. Very good. And I just, there's a, there's a question from um, Gerardo on um, your historical data and how much we think that statistical arbitrage could be made from, from historical data. I, I mean, <clears throat> I guess what I would answer is the following. At, at a high level, um, you know, statistical arbitrage would always suggest that the more data you've got, the better the uh, assessment of arbitrage opportunity because it's more consistent and you're getting a better, um, uh, I guess, validation of, of sampling that data. Um, I think that this is probably more of a question around the specific data sets in question. So I'm very happy to, to follow up um, on this point offline, uh, you know, Garaza, and, and, you know, specifically go into areas that you're thinking of is, you know, certainly we can talk around some of the data sets that are available and how that can be used for stat arbitrage. I guess, again, I'm thinking about this more around your question being focusing on, you know, how do you make investments that are um, more risk-free whilst providing returns using historical data, which is definitely something which we see. Okay, so uh, good good insight on the um, the poll of questions there, and interesting actually to see that you know you know there's a demand for insight on on you know the combination as opposed to the individual components. So look, well, I have to I have to ask you, you know, you, we talk about subtle versus brittle approaches to data. Um, I, I'm loving the terminology here, but can you expand on the implications? <laughs> what does it mean? I mean, I'm, I'm curious. So, you know, what, what what are we talking about? Yeah, yeah, certainly, Christopher, and I and I think this touches on the beauty of the of, the, of knowledge graph technology. Um, you know, uh, we, we, as you know, I mean, the, the sort of traditional in the traditional Excel kind of structure, the data is is often buried in in the table, right? And you have to pull it out. The, the story of the knowledge graph relates to what's called index-free adjacency, meaning. When you insert the data, you specify the connections to other data points. In other words, it's, it's much like sort of LinkedIn or, or even Facebook where everything, 
you know, is, is at some level related to everything else. And there's connectivity between the different data, data points. Where the concept of subtle, of supple, uh, comes in here relates to the flexibility inherent to the graph database in that you can add new nodes or new pieces of information um, without messing up or otherwise compromising the existing database or worse, having to migrate data, which is very expensive. So a supple approach like the knowledge graph puts data relationships at the very center rather than having to slice and dice data via a pivot table, you have it all interrelated and it can be expanded and extended as needed in the future going forward. So I guess I've got to follow up with you on this though, because what I really, I think we're getting to is, you know, flexible architecture moves us to the subject of the cloud and the ability to then have data organized in a way that allows, as you say, for, you know, new nodes or new uh, content to be added without having to sort of re-database everything from scratch. But, you know, I have to ask, you know, as soon as we move to that more flexible approach, what about some of the PII data restrictions, compliance restrictions? How, how do firms navigate, you know, what sounds great, Will, from a flexible perspective, but how do, they, how do, we, how do firms navigate around also the compliance implications and potentially limitations there? Yes, no, that's a great point, Christopher, and I, I, I'm, I'm keen to hear your take as well because this is a very hot topic. I mean, look, I see the cloud as an accelerator or, or enabler of these new technologies and new approaches to storage. I mean, in, in for, for one thing, I mean, for example, we've seen um, asset managers in Europe actually embrace the cloud as a way to they won't call it this, of course, but, but it's a way almost to offload responsibility for the data to a vendor, right, rather than um, put, put themselves at risk for a security breach that, that you know, may happen in their own data centers or, or being responsible for ongoing management of the data, data privacy, um, and, and, and so forth. So it's something of a double-edged sword. I, I, I do think that, um, you know, a lot of the, the regulation that's taken place in Europe, the right to be forgotten, has huge implications. And, and we've seen that, you know, in, in terms of some of the fines assessed, uh, the Googles of the world, not even financial services providers. Um, so it's something we need to be cognizant of. So, um, yeah, as I said, I mean, very curious to see how these issues are impacting your business at Refinitiv. Yeah, well, I mean, the starting point is, I think, you know, if we take the context, um, as you said at the beginning, if we if we went, we, we wound the clock back a few years, um, I think there would be very low levels of appetite for data to go into the cloud. I think clients now are much more open to, you know, thinking about whether it's Azure, whether it's AWS, and how they can start to, you know, move infrastructure and heavy cost off-site into a more um, flexible environment. I think as it comes to sort of the, the trade-off between compliance and data security, I think the kind of the starting point I'd also make is from a security angle, the investment that some of these cloud providers are putting into security is, is very high. And so when you actually look at some of the risks around data in cloud versus data on-premise, there are many scenarios to suggest that the cloud is better and more secure in a cloud than on-premise. But I think the question really around compliance is the, is the key one, where we, you know, the real crux of the detail that we see is to really understand the use case of the data in question to then establish um, the level of compliance needed. So I'll just give a, a very small example, but if you think about um, you know, how do you aggregate data on your customers or, on your, you know, how do you aggregate data to create a household? And then how do you look at that household and think about the most relevant products? You know, just to do that, there'll be a suite of, you know, personal information that, you know, has compliance um, restrictions around how freely and openly available it can be made. But, you know, actually what we also see is when you look at the use case of the output or outcomes you're trying to derive from that, there are different options that can enable actually some quite easy and flexible answers to that. So if there's simply vanilla use cases of accessing um, detail on your client that can be scaled with information in the cloud, 
you know, there's some fairly standard encryption technology that allows for that data to never actually leave the local site, but for it just to be utilized within the content in the cloud and provided back to the end user, be it the advisor in this, in this question, so that the data doesn't leave the site. But a long-winded answer really to saying the core to solving this is not to look at the broader issue of PII data and saying, how do we solve for that? But actually is to say, what is the use and validation I want to make from the information that I hold? And once you then build out those use cases of insight that you're looking to derive, you'll find that the technology answers become potentially a lot simpler to find. Yeah, well said. Okay. So, um, Semantic data is an asset. Um, you know, I, we've covered some of this, but give, give me an idea on some of the use cases. I'm happy for you to throw some of this back at me as well, Will. But, you know, looking at these, um, these kind of uh, data as an asset subject, how, how does this help with client engagement? How do I take this and then better engage with my customer? Absolutely. And it, and it's funny. I mean, it, the more I look at this graphic, the more it looks like um, sort of um, Amazon, right, from a consumer standpoint, right? You have all this information, everything from browsing history to um, kind of tolerance to financial information. The point is, or the objective is, to stitch this together. I mean, look, if, if I'm, uh, you know, buying... Uh, sort of uh, hunting equipment or, camp, you know, fancy camping equipment. I mean, that more likely than not puts me in a certain demographic, right, in terms of where I live, in terms of my age, even in terms of my gender. So it's possible to draw a tremendous amount of insights just by piecing together this information in a way that's not necessarily intrusive or, or, or demanding on the end customer, but simply simply results from sort of having your data in an accessible and, and easily digested fashion and, and drawing insights from it on the go. So, you know, this is sort of the, 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 the manifestation or the potential of, of knowledge graph technology, of graph technology brought to light. All this information is interrelated and connected. And you don't need all of it. You can need some of it. I mean, we talked about, for example, sensor-driven devices or telematics use uh, for car insurance, so it, so it's tremendously powerful. Um, you know, who controls this data, or who's able to access this data and leverage it in a way is going to be the winner. And, and this is much bigger than financial services. This is this is true of any industry. So I'd like your take. I mean, obviously, Christopher, there are a lot of there are a lot of issues related, you know, to how you're going to use this data, how you're going to obtain this data. But fundamentally, we're, we're entering a new world, as I see it, where um, you know data is king, and, and if you can draw insights from that data, you have a tremendously powerful platform. Yeah, I mean, I think the some of the core things that we would look to try and drive is um, <clears throat> relating product and associated content to some of the um, assets and information you have on your client. So we just take a very simple one, you know, the behavioral profile, the risk capacity and tolerance. You know, how, is, how can you leverage, you know, product to best suit that risk profile and tolerance of the client? And then how do you then fold in on top of that areas of specific interest that um, a client may have while still maintaining that risk? So is there, for example, um, let's say a millennial that's particularly interested in, you know, products that are in, in more environmentally and, and socially friendly um, securities. And how do you leverage that data and content along with the risk to better serve, you know, that client in question? And when you think about that, you know, when you take it at a vanilla equity level, that may not be so hard. But if you then think about, you know, various mutual funds, you know, and understanding the underlying holdings and making sure that they are actually, um, you know, concord to the preference of the client, that's where, you know, linking those uh, risk um, or behavioral profiles with preferences to then product is, is, you know, just a very 
um, obvious use case where we think you can better engage because you're providing more relevant products to your client. And again, your client will then feel that they are receiving a more bespoke service based on their interests. So it's kind of a two-way a two-way um, focus. And then, you know, things like um, household information. I mean, this all really comes down to there's some quite um, standard things you can do around, you know, aggregating data. So a use case to aggregate the household or aggregate, sorry, the accounts and people that make up the household so that whilst you're looking at all of these dependencies of factors uh, under the household information, at a broad level, you're also still managing the risk of that household in a holistic way rather than an account-driven way. And that could be from any type of aggregation of, of preferences to the household so that then, you know, you, you can see, you know, some standard things around what is the exposure to that household of the euro or what is the exposure of that household to investments in Asia or whatever that may be. And, you know, how do we then make sure that, that those exposures at the household level are fairly allocated and also concord with some of the preferences that, you know, the household has? Okay, so we're, we're drawing close to the to the end. I guess we've got one last question, and then I think you know maybe we should um, uh, sort of wrap up. So um, I guess you know last question: If you were given a blank check, what would you fix or invest in? Um, and you know, as as you uh, answer this, I mean, Will, I, I'm going to ask this to you. I mean, if you had a blank check, Will, what would you invest in? <laughs> well, you've kind of heard my take. I mean, you've got to get your data house in order to do the predictive analytics and machine learning. So I'd invest in architecture and structure, start there, and then invest in some really smart people who can help me leverage that, that, that new structure. How about you? Yeah, I mean, again, I, would really, I do agree with the... Um, I agree with the architecture. And then maybe just to... You know, if I again coming back to some of the things that um, we've discussed, but I I really believe that there's so much value you can get if you pull all of the information that you have on your customer from CRM, from external sources, from back office into a single database of record or at least a single uh, location, so that you can better assess the you know the preferences and the details of your client. And then maybe, you know, outside of information on your client, um, you know, and, you know, the, all, all of the, um, I guess, foundational component, you know, we would sort of look at some of the, um, I guess, the analytics that you can take off that to, you know, better understand other areas of interest. And that would be also, the analytic would be tied to alternative data. I do think alternative data can provide some very good insight. I mentioned environmental, social, and governance data. There's a, there's a big interest around understanding some of those metrics, the scoring of ESG factors, and how that relates to not just single assets, but collective interest, investment vehicles like um, you know, mutual funds and ETFs as well. Mm. So let's, let's go to the answer. Let's see what people have said. Um, so actually, quite a mixed view. That's quite interesting. Um, so predictive analytics and databasing win, but then machine learning and unstructured data insight win as well. I guess, um, you know, quite an interesting take there. Will, anything you want to add? Will, are you there? Uh, yeah, yes. Um, all data, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I think this is incredibly powerful, and we've talked a bit about, you know, social content and online, but there's all sorts of other types of alt data, including, you know, the proverbial tracking of, of cars in the parking lot at Walmart, right, satellite data. So, I mean, this is, this is something where I know you're investing at Refinitiv. Um, is there any specific use case you see as, 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 as particularly compelling? Well, look, from an alternative data perspective, I would say that, um, you know, certainly alternative data should be looked at it maybe in two ways. Number one, um, physical data sources. So we would see that environmental, social, and governance data is an area that we're putting a lot of investment in because a number of our customers and their clients are asking for, um, you know, 
investment in vehicles which have better ESG scoring. But then the other thing that we would see as alternative data is the analytics. So things like sentiment scoring or relevancy scoring or most read or all of these things which sort of sit on top of the data. Um, you know, sentiment scoring, particularly with things like, um, you know, news, um, so that it's, it's just an alternative way of, of you know, looking at information or research or commentary, but from a sentiment scoring perspective. But I think for, for this webinar, I mean, look, first and foremost, Will, thank you so much. Um, I'm so grateful for your time and, and your, your thoughts and insights. Um, to all of our participants, thank you so much for joining. Um, we can share the slides and um, any of the questions asked on, online as well, I will look to respond um, personally afterwards. But uh, I'm very grateful for everyone's time. I hope this has been of value. We will share the detail afterwards. Uh, and thank you so much for joining again. Thank you, Christopher.